Good morning, Foothills Church. Good to see all of you. If you are newer uh, to Foothills Church, my name is Brian. I'm lead pastor here. It's great to have you. Uh, if you would pull out your Bibles, we're stepping into our sermon time together and encourage you to get your scriptures out so you can follow along as we continue our series in the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 today. And so uh, if you didn't bring a copy of the Bible with you, underneath the chair in front of you, either to the left or right, there should be a copy for you there. In fact, you could take that one and make it yours if you don't have a Bible of your own. We'd love that uh, to be a gift uh, from us to you. So uh, bring it back with you each and every time you can be with us. While you're finding a way to Ephesians 3, let me say a word of welcome to those joining us from the chapel and those tuning in online, maybe not able to make a a service or venue uh, this morning and tuning in later throughout the week. We're grateful you guys are taking the time to sit down and do that as well. Before we step into message, though, I've got some friends with me here I want you to meet. These are my Dorcas Quilter Ministry friends, and many of you know them. And uh, they are uh, here to display some of their works of art and also to uh, invite us to pray for these quilts that they've created this last year because they're about to deliver them to the CASA ministry, uh, their CASA program rather, up in uh, uh, Placerville. And uh, each and every child who's a part of that program gets one of these quilts. And on the back, there's a little tag that reminds them they're loved by Foothills Church and uh, that uh, we, we love Jesus and we love them and so we'll get a chance to do that. These guys have been at this for a while. You, you're, you quilters, yeah. You've, uh, you've created 1,286 quilts in 15 years. Here, here's what I love about these ladies. They have turned uh, their hobby into a pathway to communicate the love of Jesus. <laughs> they've, commu- they've taken their hobby and they've turned it into a, a pathway to minister to people and uh, to share with them and show kindness to them. So uh, we are so grateful for you guys. And uh, let's see, there's about 24 of you. Is that, that's right, 24 quilters. And this year alone, 101 quilts. And so uh, it's been a a terrific year. Also, 12 of these quilts are going for some injured veterans in our county. So thank you for being a part of that as well. That's really cool. All right, let's pray for them. Uh, and Make them hold their arms up longer. (laughs) As soon as we pray, you guys can put your arms down. Lord God, we are so grateful for these friends that, uh, first of all, love you, and they're t- they've turned this love of quilting into a way to, to channel and, and communicate your love to uh, these children and some of these veterans, Lord. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure how you do it, but we are going to ask that your spirit would uh, go with th- these uh, sort of labors of love in these quilts that that you would be present when they're handed off and when that exchange happens, that you would uh, somehow uh, open the eyes of the hearts of these kids to know that uh, someone cares about them and that you care about them, that they matter to us and that they matter to you and we love them. And so would you just sort of plant that seed in their hearts and minds and steer their hearts to you, draw them to yourself, and uh, minister, Lord. Minister and glorify yourself through these gifts as they go out uh, in a few weeks. So we commit it to you, and we commit these ladies to you and their ministry to you, and continue to bless them, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right. Thanks, ladies. Another uh, update for you on our Room for Others effort. I've been letting you know that we're pulling in the pledges and we're waiting for gifts to be given. And so far, with the monies that have already been given, as well as the pledges over this last four weeks, it looks like we are on track to be fully funded by April 2020. So... The only variable, of course, is is that monies pledged actually are given, right? So that's the variable that we play with and juggle a bit. And if you have not had a chance to turn in your commitment card, please uh, continue to do that and be praying about that. Tomorrow night, our leadership board is actually going to be getting together for a very important meeting 
uh, making some decisions about this and, and pulling the trigger on some things and moving forward and if now's the right time and, and all that sort of thing. But it looks very, very positive. So way to go, church. Way to go. God did some cool stuff in you and, and is doing stuff through you. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll keep you posted. Awesome. <laughs> All right, today we take another step in our series in the book of Ephesians, and we're calling this series Included because Paul takes uh, a tremendous amount of effort in the early chapters of Ephesians to remind us that when we place our trust and our faith in Jesus, something amazing happens. We are actually joined with Christ. We are actually included in him. He's no longer just with us, but we are in him and he is in us. And that gives way to an incredible amount of blessings and benefits and consequences, if you will, that are super positive for us as individuals who are in Christ. We have a lot to celebrate, right? As ones who are in Christ. It's a work of God in our lives that that joins us to Jesus when we place our faith and trust in him. And today... What you're going to notice is is that Paul begins to turn the conversation a bit. Up till now, it's been about how you and I, as included ones, are blessed and how we benefit being in Christ. Today, the conversation shifts a bit to where it now begins to say, now how should you then live because of those realities? What what difference does it make in how you uh, conduct your life, how you organize your life, how you live your life? Uh, how does being included impact what kind of person you are? Uh, what kind of church we are? What, w- how we do church together? What, what does being included have to say about that? And really, the, the remainder of the book of Ephesians, really, uh, chapters 4 through, the, through 6, are all about the so what of our standing in Christ. Does that make sense? And so we're going to be picking that story up uh, after the first of the year. But Paul begins to turn that conversation today. And uh, let's look together at the first five verses of chapter 3 as we uh, see where Paul takes us uh, on this journey. You'll notice right from the very beginning, the first three words, for this reason, that this section is tied to last week's section, the end of chapter 2. Paul is is continuing in, some, in, in a theme here and before he does a bit of transition in the middle of our text for today. For this reason, verse 1, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. Now he's speaking it to Gentiles here, and most of you are aware that Gentile simply means any, anybody who's not a Jew, <laughs> okay? So that's who he's, he's addressing this to, and that's what he says, this administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, verse four, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And of course, Paul is one of those. Let's pause there for a second. In this section, as chapter 3 opens up, Paul is again referring to this whole administration of grace that's been given to him. And when he says that, he's basically, he's basically referring to the work of God in his life that, that brought him to this place that he's currently serving in. If you know Paul's story, it's quite a journey from where he was to where he is now. Uh, it, it, it's an incredible story about how God graced him and pursued him and revealed himself to him in a very dramatic way and then guided him into service as his apostle. If you want to read the rest of the story, uh, Acts chapter 8 and following gives you all the, the gory details. It's, very, it's a very fun story to read. And this, this journey that Paul's been on with Jesus really shocks him at times. He he realizes he was the worst of the worst. Maybe maybe you'll identify with this some in your own testimony, but Paul Paul realizes he was the worst of the worst. When Christianity was in its infancy, 
Paul was on a, you could say, a seek and destroy mission for any who were followers of Jesus. He didn't care where they were or where he had to hunt them down, but he was going to do it in every corner, and he was going to make sure that they were, they were uh, dealt with. So you could say when it came to be an apostle, Paul ranked last on the list of the applicants. I mean, he's not a likely candidate necessarily. When it comes to, to, to being an apostle, Paul, Paul's shocked that he is in this role at all. But Christ got a hold of him. Christ got a hold of him, and, and all that changed. Paul would occasionally marvel at the lengths God went to open his eyes to Jesus, to transform his life from a Jesus hater, from a Christian killer, to a Jesus lover, and one who was leading people to meet Jesus. Again, you can read the whole story in Acts chapter 8 and 9. It truly is an incredible transformation. I have a question for you. Do you remember, do you remember how God brought you to a realization of who Jesus was or who he is? Do you remember the people he used in your life? Do you remember the circumstances that happened that, that, that God was at work in that, that brought you from someone who was ignoring God and, and not really caring about what God cared about to a point where now you're sitting here today listening to me? Do, do you remember the, the, the journey you've been on? I think it's important for us to, to every now and then sit back and think about all that God orchestrated in your life to get you to this place where now you're a Jesus follower, most of you, many of you, you're a Jesus lover, you're training to live like him and love like him. It's quite an important thing for us to keep in mind. As apostle, Paul, as an apostle, he, he sees himself as a kind of steward appointed by God to be a spokesperson about the riches of Christ to all of humankind, especially the Gentiles, those non-Jewish folks in the regions where he traveled. And in our verses today, Paul says that he was a, a steward of what he calls a mystery. I want you to notice that. A number of times the word mystery used. Now, mystery in the New Testament doesn't mean something that's fuzzy or unclear or uncertain. Instead, it's a technical term that refers to a truth that had not been previously made known, and in many cases, a truth that can never really be grasped or understood by mere human ability or rational, ration, uh, you know, just rational thinking. It's got to be the mystery Paul talks about is something that is revealed to someone by the Holy Spirit. It's really, in that way, a mystery that any of us come to Jesus, right? It's a, it's a work of the Spirit in us. In these verses, it seems Paul uses the mystery, uh, uh, the word mystery, in a couple different sorts of uh, senses, you could say, or, or with a couple different understandings in it. And when you first read it, it's kind of, it can be confusing. But it's helpful to understand that on, in one usage, Paul is referring to a kind of general mystery. This is, this is really the, the whole story of Jesus. This is... This is the story of God's son, Jesus, coming, living, dying on the cross, raised from the dead, being seated at the right hand of the Father. It's that whole revelation and incarnation of Jesus. It's kind of the, the general mystery. In fact, in verse 12, he mentions one of the blessings that, that come with being included in Christ because of faith in Jesus. We've been talking about a lot of those blessings, and he mentions another one there in verse 12. If you look at that, he talks about the freedom that we have as we approach God with confidence, not in fear, not in uncertainty, not guilt, not shame. Again, the revelation of Jesus and all of the impact of Jesus in our lives. That's what Paul would sort of, it seems to use the word mystery in a general sense, but there, there's another usage of the word mystery in this text. Paul is emphasizing one of the blessings that come when you're included with Christ. You could say it's a particular mystery. And that mystery Paul refers to as the absolute unity and oneness in Christ for all people who place their faith in him. We talked about this last week. Pastor Sam led us in the last half of chapter two 
which talked about that kind of unity. Notice how Paul emphasizes it again in our text today. Look at verse 6. He says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the, notice, notice the repetitive word use of the word together. You might want to underline that in your text. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. To say that Gentiles are now heirs together with Israel is, is not to simply say that they've been allowed to come in and enjoy the blessings of Christ that were primarily given for the Jews, but we're piggybacking on that. We're riding on their coattails, you might say. It's, it's, it's more than that. Instead, what Paul's saying is in Christ, Jews and Gentiles, listen carefully, are now, Jews and Gentiles are now coming into one brand new thing, the church. The Jew is an equal sharer with the Gentile. The Gentile equal share with the Jew. There's no difference. They're both, literally, Paul calls them fellow heirs. Fellow heirs. They have the same place, as it were, in God's will. They are to receive the same benefits. Jews and Gentiles together. He says, heirs together with Israel. Secondly, members together with one, of one body. He's speaking about Jews and Gentiles as if they're, they're, they're joints fitted together in a body, all joints in the same body, fitted together, each with their purpose. No distinction any longer. There's no superiority or inferiority. Each special. Each has their place. Thirdly, Paul says, they're sharers together in the promises of Christ. Here he's speaking primarily to the promise of the resurrection and the coming of the new heaven and the new earth. All of the, all of the implications of, of what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection really accomplished. So he's not simply celebrating that Jew, Jews and Gentiles alike can be saved, but that they are together in close relationship with one another in Christ and forming the church, a brand new thing. The reason is what we studied last week, what Sam led us through, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Jews and Gentiles brought near by the blood of Christ. Christ abolished the barrier between Jew and Gentile, and they are being built together into a dwelling of God by the Spirit. Paul's, Paul's fascinated by this mystery. He's fascinated by it. And having reminded us of this mystery, this incredible reality, that's a part of the boundless riches of Christ, Paul again talks openly about how shocked he is that God would trust him with that message. You ever, you ever stand amazed that God would actually ask you to partner with him in ministry? <laughs> I mean, Paul, look at verse 7. Paul says, I became a servant of this gospel, notice, not by his good looks, not by the fact of being a Jew, not by the fact of being a Pharisee, not because of his education, not because of his experience. He says, I became a servant of this gospel, notice, by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. By God's grace, Paul says, I have become a servant of this gospel. By this grace, I have become a servant of this incredible truth about Jesus the gospel of Jesus, meaning good news about him and all the implications that come with following him. He says, it was a gift of God's grace that enabled me to do it and his power at work in me. How many identify with that, right? 
We, we're serving because, not because of who we are, not because of our education, not because of our experience. We're, we're blessed by the grace of God in our lives and his power at work through us. I love it when Paul is open about his unworthiness because I can relate, right? I love it when he's open about how he doesn't deserve anything that he's ever that his capability and his competence is not found in himself, but in the work of Jesus and in him. Because you know what? Many of us feel unworthy to be partnered with God in ministry in any, of any sort. Many of us feel unworthy or incapable, for example, of leading someone to Christ. Many of us cringe at the E word, evangelism. We think we're too, we're unworthy. Our lives aren't a good enough example or we're incapable. We don't know enough about the Bible. We, we tend to play these kinds of excuses in our hearts and minds and, and, and we think there's questions we won't be able to answer. But friends, we got to remember, even Paul recognized that it is only by God's grace administered to him and the power of God at work in him that he has any hope of effectively fulfilling his calling. Yay? So we're all in the same boat with him in that, right? Once Paul reminds us that it was only by God's grace that he was made a messenger of all this incredible truth about Jesus, he then announces that it is now God's intent for the included ones, right? The included ones, that's us. It is now God's intent for the included ones in the church to be his messengers. Look at verse 10. His intent was that now through what? What's it say? What's your Bible say? His intent was that now through the, the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he had accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, what Paul was originally graced and empowered and called to do, he's now saying, that's your call, included ones. What Paul was originally called to do, God now, the text says, intends the church to do. The church are those included ones. So he's referring to each and every one of us who are already Christians. We are now to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Doesn't that sound intimidating? Go make known the manifold wisdom of God. <laughs> you got to use a deep voice whenever you talk about it. Basically, the manifold wisdom of God refers to the revelation of God and of his son Jesus that we have in this. Basically, he's saying, church, it's your job now. God intends for you to make this book known, this truth known to the world around you. That's what he's saying. The manifold wisdom of God. It refers to the salvation of Jesus, all the implications of his resurrection, his ongoing, uh, his ongoing work in our lives, all of it. Those included in Christ are to make the truth of God and the wisdom of God known to those near us and to those far from us, to those like us and to those unlike us. That's our calling, friends. Now, I want you to notice to whom we are to make this wisdom known. This is another intimidating sounding part of this call. Paul says in verse 10, look at it in your Bibles, you're supposed to make this known to politicians and governors and, in, in, oh, no, rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. What? We're to make this known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Paul, Paul uses these kinds of terms in his writing to refer to sometimes the heavenly angels, but also to refer to the evil spiritual principles and powers that exist in the unseen world. Remember, the mysteries about Jesus and all the implications of faith in him have been, Paul says, hidden in God. 
But now they are revealed, Paul says, and as he writes, he says, now it's happened. Now Jesus has come. Now it's been revealed. Paul is telling us that the church is designed to showcase God's great love, grace, and power. And not just to those on earth, but to the forces in the heavenly realms. In other words, the church will be his showcase for his grand plan of forgiveness for sin and faith in Jesus uh, who was killed on the cross and then raised and then seated at the right hand of the Father. In other words, the church is going to put it in the face of the enemy, friends. He's going to use the church to showcase the glory of God, God's, God's power at work. The power and transforming power of Jesus in the lives of sinful human beings. He's going to showcase his grace, his love, and his mercy. Friends, there is so much going on in the universe that doesn't meet the eye. Paul often talks about these spiritual principalities and powers that are, that are real. And for Paul, there's some sort of a connection between the authorities and the powers in the heavenly realms and the authority of powers in, in our world. There's some sort of connection, be they good or be they evil. And Paul is saying now the church is right in the middle of that struggle. So what are the implications for all of this for you and for me? Well, first of all, I hope you can see from this text already that the church is special in God's eyes. The church is special. Please realize the church was not an afterthought. It was never an audible. You know, God didn't step up to the scrimmage line of the universe and see evil pulling a stunt and yell, Omaha, Omaha, and call another play. Let's come up, let's make a church. Our text makes it clear the church, friends, is the purpose and plan of God from ages past and is now and only now revealed in order to showcase God's glory. I don't know what your feelings are about the church. I mean, I can guess if you're coming here on a regular basis, you have fairly favorable opinion of the church. Not just this church, but the church in general. But not everybody feels that way, right? A lot of people poke fun at the church. A lot of people mock the church in our culture. A lot of people shake their head at the church. I get it. She's imperfect. She's fickle. At times, she's frustrating. At times, the the church is embarrassing. At times, the church is hypocritical. At times, the church is scandalous. At times, the church is seemingly impotent. But it's God's intent, Paul says. Listen to his words. It's God's intent to use her to change history with her message of Jesus. Do you hear that? And she has, when you step back and look over the course of time. The church is still alive despite all her imperfection, yay? Guys, The church is God's chosen vehicle to tell others about Jesus and his blessings of being included in him. That's our calling as his church. This is God the Father's intention for us. I know sometimes it doesn't make sense. In fact, I I love this analogy. I saw this story. When a high school orchestra attempts Beethoven's Ninth Symphony... Depending on the school, the result could be appalling. It might even make old Ludwig roll over in his grave even though he was deaf. You might ask, well, why bother? Why inflict on those poor kids the terrible burden of trying to render what the immortal Beethoven had in mind? Not even the great Chicago Symphony can obtain perfection in it. The answer is this. The high school orchestra will give some people in that audience a taste of Beethoven, and this might be their only encounter with Beethoven's great ninth symphony. Far from perfection, it is nevertheless the only way that they will hear Beethoven's message. You see, the only way a starving, thirsty, deluded, and suffering world will ever hear the music of the gospel is through 
the body of Christ, the church. Arguably the worst high school orchestra ever to appear on a bandstand. If performance standards are really the most important measure, then the church is in trouble. But God is determined to trade the perfection of his solo performance for the possibility of playing a little improvisational jazz with us, the screechy saxophone players in the kingdom of God's ragtime band. The church is special, friends. The church is special. Despite what you think about her, God only started two institutions, marriage and the church. So she is worth your serious investment of your time, of your talent, of your treasure, not your leftovers, your first fruits. She's worth it. Not only is the church special, but her message is the most important message people in our neighborhoods and nations need to hear. And God's intention is to use the church to spread that truth, friends. God's intention is to use the church to spread the truth of Jesus throughout the world. And since God's intention is so, this is why in our mission statement, the first part of it says, we exist to connect people to Jesus. Why? Because it's God's intent for us. God's intention is why we design our Christmas and Easter programs to be uh, targeted primarily at unchurched and unreached people. If you come to a Christmas Eve or an Easter service and you think, I didn't quite do it for me, great! You're already saved, great! Because when we plan sermons and we plan uh, uh, worship uh, songs and we plan those services, we always have the unchurched, the unreached primarily in view. We want a service that you'll love. We do. We try to do it so that it makes sense to you and encourages you as, a, as an included one. But our design is because it's God's intent is to include others, right? God's intention is why each of our ministry areas plan and execute regular events where the news about Jesus and the blessings of being included in him are shared and an invitation is given so that they have a chance to connect with Jesus. God's intention is why we're working together and pooling our resources in this room for others' effort. We're not not trying to grow a big church just to grow a big church. Let's just grow a big church. That would be cool. No, no. We're we're making room for others because it's God's intent that we reach more and more and more people for him. Make sense? Because connecting people to Jesus is God's intention for us, we must never let this priority slide out of first place. It's too easy for budgets and programming to slowly over time grow to support the reached and their needs rather than the unreached and their need to connect with Jesus. We must keep God's intention our priority, friends. Finally, if if it's God's intention for the church to make his wisdom and truth known, which we've seen from our text today that it is, then that means his intention is for you to be part of that distribution. (laughs) The intent is, is that you are the church, right? It's It's the church who's going to spread the news of Jesus. Who's the church? Us, Us, right? So that means that you and I have to have have a responsibility in this. We have a part to play in this. Sometimes in a church our size, it's easy to say, oh, you know, sharing Christ and giving an invitation, that's the pastor's job. That's the elder's job. That's that's a Sunday school and a want a leader's job. But remember, when the Bible uses the term church, it refers to those who are already included in her. At the end of our manuscript today, uh, online, if you want to pursue this out, I wanted to create a couple of, or or attach a couple of um, tools for you to use. There's two tools in there. The first tool is a Bible study that will enable you to 
to think through your story of how you came to Jesus, to know its parts, to understand how to tell your story to somebody else. Many of you are already believers, you're already included, but if we ask you to t- share your story, you'd stumble through that. And so this Bible study is, is designed to help you think that through. It's very brief, but it helps you think through the parts and pieces of your story so that you can put that together and be prepared that when God opens the door, you're able to tell your story of how Jesus impacted and changed your life. There's a second tool at the end of my manuscript online that you can chase out, and that is uh, the, the, the sort of four-point, very, very easy-to-remember outline that helps you share Christ with somebody and lead them to a personal saving knowledge of Him. It's the four points we've talked about before. It's love of God, sin of man, cross of Christ, and prayer of faith, right? And it starts with a very simple question. Has anyone ever explained to you how to become a Christian? And it was like, well, no, not really. Though you start out, you start talking about the love of God and how much he loves people. And then you talk about the sin of man and then the amazing grace and cross of Christ. And then you invite them to, to pray with you in, in that as that conversation goes. It's a very easy tool to remember. And it's one that each of us, along with our story, should have freshly in our mind so that we're ready. If, the, if it's God's intent for us to make him known, Each of us has got some work to do, right? So that we're ready and prepared. So I put those at the end of my manuscript so that you can search them out. They're written there. Small group leaders, uh, chase that down and and talk that through with your small group this week. It would be a good part of your exercise, all right? Let's pray. Lord, you're good to us and kind. Your word is so clear. We've been looking at all of the incredible implications for us, blessings in the heavenly realms, that are true for us as included ones. And now today we've, we've started to see that it ought to make a difference in how we live and that you've called us to be your ambassadors, your spokespersons for all of the truth about who you are. So Lord, continue to grow us and mature us and ready us. Help us understand uh, what our part is so that we're prepared so that when you open the door in those conversations, we're, we're ready to step through that with somebody. Thank you for your word, Lord. It's always a great reminders for us, always great insight and, and truth for us. We're grateful. And now as we continue our time of worship, we do so through the giving of our tithes and offerings and then our response together, Lord, is it's all to glorify you. You've provided everything we have You and your church uh, are special, and we are honored to be a part. We're honored to be included. And so bless each gift and each giver today as they honor you with their wealth and as they refuse to be in bondage to materialism by releasing these gifts to you. We pray it in your sweet and loving name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Foothills family. Pastor Phil here with the latest on what's going on around your church. Congratulations to our newest members, Steve and Laura Bowen, Casey and Larissa Quintard, and Tom Fox. If you're interested in becoming a member, stay tuned for details about our next membership class happening in February. Ladies, our annual Foothills Women's Bible Study Christmas Brunch is coming up. Whether or not you're part of the regular Bible study, it's gonna be held on December 10th from 8.45 to 11 a.m and our speaker is Julia McDaniel. It's a potluck, so make sure you bring a yummy dish to share. You can contact Donna Parsons for any questions. Just a reminder this week, if you would like a few of the pastors or elders to pray with you and anoint you with oil for healing of any kind, please call Debbie at the church office and we will make that happen. We've launched a new ministry here at Foothills Church, Celebrate Recovery. And this ministry is for anyone struggling with areas in their life, whether it's codependency or anger, financial burdens, chemical dependency, or something else. It's a Christ-centered 12-step program where we gain healing through Christ and community by knowing that we're not alone. For more info, check out our website, foothillscp.org slash celebrate recovery, and you can join us every Monday evening. Here's Dylan to tell us about an awesome partnership opportunity with the Arab American Learning Center. 
Hey friends, you guys know over the last three years, we've been partnering with the Arab American Learning Center and their annual Christmas outreach program by providing gift boxes full of gifts for their kids. Well, as the, as the center has grown, as they've gotten to know the refugee community better, they're also trying to adapt to the needs of that community. So this year they've asked us to provide one meaningful gift or toy for each child instead of a box full of smaller things. Gifts are things like a, a doll, or a stuffed animal for the little ones, maybe a soccer ball and a pump, or even for the teenagers, a jacket or a coat. So if you're interested in being part of this year's toy and coat drive, please head out to the patio, grab one of these gift tags, and then bring your gift back to us by December 8th. We will box it and make sure it gets to the center before their outreach ministry. And just so you know, every family will also receive a Bible and a Jesus DVD along with the gift for their child. Have you checked out the Foothills app yet? If not, what you waiting for? You can find Foothills Monthly, you can read the church blogs, watch sermons, sync events to your calendar, and even do the fill-in or freehand notes. Just search Foothills CP in the iTunes or the Google Play Store. If you're visiting with us today, we are so glad you're here. Will you do us a favor and fill out the green Connect card in the chair pocket in front of you? You can take it to the welcome booth out front after the service because we've got a special gift we'd love to give you as our thanks for joining us today. Well, that's about all from me for now. Make sure you grab your cell phone and set that baby to silence so it won't disturb you or those around you as we continue to worship God together through the study of his word. Have a great morning.